Morning, or evening, Grace Brother and a sister. Great to have everybody back on with us here uh, with uh, Word Awakening and a special video here. Uh, not really just giving an update. Uh, we've also got uh, a number of things that we're going to look at here. But giving an update, though, about our uh, prayer boot camp and uh, really the only update that we have. Um, I guess just particularly is to just keep praying, amen, like the Bible says, pray without ceasing. But we do want to look at something else, though, here that uh, certainly has to do with prayer. Everything can relate to prayer, but uh, you saw the title there. And uh, we're looking at holiness, holiness or hypocrisy. And, you know, are we holy in our prayer life? See, if you have a strong prayer life, you know, then you are going to have a holy life. Because, you know, God doesn't hear a sinner. God doesn't hear somebody that has iniquity in their heart. You know, if you're not walking with God and you have sin in your life, God doesn't hear you. Somebody with a strong prayer life is, you know, going to simply have a strong life. You know, they're going to have a strong spiritual life, a strong personal life. You know, they're going to be walking in the will of God. And if not, then, you know, they're probably going to be given to hypocrisy of, of some way, of some way, you know, shape, form, or fashion. And hypocrisy is a very, very ugly word, you know, by, by my opinion. I, I suppose that's just my opinion. I would probably have to say that um, hypocrisy is about the ugliest word in the English language. Because, you know, who wants to be a hypocrite? Nobody wants to be a hypocrite, right? I mean, not even people who are non-Christians. You know, if you have somebody that uh, practices some other faith, some other religion, or they live by some other philosophy, you know, they don't want to be called a hypocrite, you know. You know, you want to be something or the other. You know, nobody wants that. But um, looking at this here, though, and... Uh, and at the present time, you know, of recording this, I don't know how long it's going to last, but, you know, it's going to go a bit of a while. This is really a, a message that we're going to preach here. But looking at holiness or hypocrisy. Holiness and hypocrisy are at opposite ends, you know, of the Christian life spectrum. You know, as we said, opposite ends, you know, really of any spectrum. Nobody wants to be called a hypocrite, you know, not even somebody that you know, subscribes to a religion other than Christianity or, you know, lives their life according to a different principle, a different philosophy. Although, you know, the truth is lots, this is really where the issue with all this lies, though, in Christianity. You know, lots of newly evangelicals, liberals, you know, and even lots of lukewarm people in fundamental churches, they consider themselves somewhere to be in the middle, because like we've said pretty often, we said that not long ago, uh, like uh, like like when I was preaching in our weekend study or Sunday sermon, something or another, we mentioned that. You know, holiness is a word that you don't even find in fundamental churches very often anymore. You know, like liberals and newly evangelicals, you know, they've just about completely forsaken the word. And even, you know, fundamentalists, you know, that that's not something that they just mention very often. You know, because the truth is, churches just do not love holiness. They don't love holiness. They don't live holiness. You know, they don't endeavor to be holy. You know, and that's why we have such, you know, worldly churches. You know, we, we don't have holy churches. You know, we, we don't have churches having revival, you know, having a revival of holiness. You know, we do have the opposite. You know, we got churches that are just getting more worldly. You know, churches that are just spiritually dead. But a lot of people, though, they'll just say, well, I'm somewhere in the middle. You know, they'll give you the, well, we're not perfect and not as faithful as we should be, but, you know, we're not hypocrites. You know, that's just how people respond to questions, you know, about their faithfulness, you know, and their spiritual life. You know, but is this response biblical, you know, to be in the middle? And the Bible tells us repeatedly that we're not to love, that we're not to love, that, that we are, sorry, we are, we are to love the Lord with all our heart, mind, and soul. You know, never does the Bible say, you know, or endorse just giving God half your heart. Like, first we'll go to the book of Matthew in chapter number 22. I encourage you to follow along with me in the Word of God if you haven't got a Bible handily and if, you know, you're able to do that. I know some people have a tendency to just listen to preaching whenever they're eating or, you know, reading or studying something else or, you know, what have you. But uh, looking at Matthew 22, 37, Jesus said, Jesus said unto him, 
Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. And then we go over to Mark 12, 30. Mark 12, 30. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And we got that again in the book of Luke, chapter number 10. Luke 10, 27. And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. So now we can even go back to the Old Testament, you know, really what uh, Jesus was preaching out of in Deuteronomy chapter number 6, right, the text here where Jesus and was getting this from out of the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse number 5, Deuteronomy 6, 5, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And one more time in Deuteronomy 10, 12, just a few chapters over, says, And now Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul. And these here are or just some of the verses, there are even more verses in the Bible that, you know, have this type of language about giving God a whole heart. But we see here that we're to love the Lord with all our heart, mind, and soul. I like how verse number 12 says it there, Deuteronomy 10. It says to walk in all His ways. See, and how many people neglect to do that? You know, you, know, you hear that and say, well, I know i got things in my life that shouldn't be. I know I let my children do things that, uh, you know, they should not be doing. You know, you know, I know I have this, that, and the other, you know, going on. I know I watch, you know, television programs I shouldn't. I spend too much time with television. I spend too much money on, you know, sports apparel and et cetera, et cetera. And people just admit that. You know, most people, to some extent, they will just admit that. You know, I got, I got things in my life that shouldn't, and we'll mention that toward the end of this. But see, we're to walk in all the ways of God, serve Him with all our heart, mind, and soul. See, like a Joshua, chapter 22 and verse 5. Joshua 22, 5, it says, But take diligent heed to do the commandment and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, charged you, to love the Lord your God, and to walk in all his ways, and to keep his commandments, and to cleave unto him, and to serve him with all your heart, with all your soul. See, we're to walk in all the ways of God's word. Deuteronomy chapter 13. Going back to Deuteronomy in chapter number 13. Deuteronomy 13, 13, says, Certain men, the children of Belial, are gone out from among you, and have withdrawn the inhabitants of their city, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which ye have not known. See, we're not to do anything the way of the world or the way of a false teacher. We are to be obedient to everything the Lord requires of us. But say, that's the problem. That's what you've got a mixture of. See, that's the problem with liberalism and newly evangelicalism. They mix worldly philosophy with the Bible. You know, they mix the Bible with a worldly philosophy. Because see, the thing is that this crowd, this is what you have to say to them, the half-hearted crowd, well, I know I'm not giving God everything. You know, I, know, I know I'm not giving God everything. I know I got this, that, the other in my life that ought to not be. Well, I'm glad God wasn't like that, aren't you? The Lord wasn't slack or half-hearted. We need to send His only begotten Son to take our place on the cross. It's like John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. 
that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. See, he gave us his only begotten son to take our place on the cross so that we wouldn't have to go through, so that we wouldn't have to go to hell. How much more should we give God all of our life? You know, just as much, of course, we'll never match the sacrifice of what God did. You know, that's why we should just say, hey, I'm going to serve God now and always. You know, we need to say, like it says in the book of Joshua, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. I'm going to do right by prayer in the Bible. I'm going to do right by living clean. I'm going to do right by living holy. I'm going to do right... You know, by being a witness and by raising my children, God sent His only begotten Son to die for me. So about the least that I could do is to raise my children for the Lord's honor and glory. And guess what? That's for their own good. You know, your children may not like some of the standards that you implement, especially if, you know, they've been doing something contrary to them. I had that same problem when I was 12, 13 years old. You know, my dad implemented some standards in my home. You know, when I was a young teenager, I was a big fan of rock and heavy metal music. You know, that was one thing that I lived for, you know, constantly. You know, God made, uh, my, my dad, you know, made me get that out of my house according to God's commandments. Didn't like it at the time, but guess what? Now I'm very thankful for it. Like I go to 1 John in chapter number 4, 1 John 4.10, a very familiar verse, says, Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the perpetuation for our sins. He certainly God loved us before we loved Him. Romans chapter 5 and verse number 8 says, But God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us, amen. While we were yet sinners. And now we're going to go to Hebrews in chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. I'm going to switch gears a little bit and really look at this topic of holiness. In Hebrews chapter number 12 and verse number 14. Hebrews 12, 14, says, Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. A person walking with God will have holiness in their life. As the verse says there, nobody can see God without holiness. And we'll put a little bit more of an emphasis on that toward the end of this sermon. But see, if you're walking with God, you're going to have holiness in your life. God's greatest attribute is holiness. You know, that's the problem with people now. They want God, but they don't want any holiness. But you cannot have God, you know, without holiness. Like people want to be in what they call an open marriage. See, you know, even people that aren't religious or Christians, you know, most people will agree that an open marriage is immoral. But, you know, that's really what people want with God. You know, that's, you know, kind of the theme of the book of Jose. You know, that's what the book of Jose represents. You know, those people were committing spiritual adultery, the northern kingdom. You know, they were committing spiritual adultery on God. See, that's what people want to do now. You know, they want God, but they don't want to be faithful to Him. You know, just most people will agree that it's wrong to marry somebody and then not be faithful to them, to cheat on them, but that's exactly what people do with God. You know, they want God in their life. They want God's blessing. That's really what they want is God's blessings. You know, a lot of people, they want God to keep their bank account full and keep them in good health and so forth, but, you know, they don't want to give God anything. They don't want to be faithful to God. They want to go out and enjoy the world. In 2 Corinthians 7 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. See, a believer walking with God is going to cleanse their self from worldliness and fleshliness, and they're going to perfect holiness. 
That word perfecting, as we often say here, that's not saying that you live a sinlessly perfect life, but that means to be complete in holiness. That means whenever God reveals something to me that should not be in my life, I get it out. God did that with, with uh, me last night, with my daughter. There was something that uh, she was watching that seems relatively innocent, but something that she ought to not be watching. See, that's a mature Christian that has a consistent walk with God that is abstaining from worldliness. You know, somebody that has gone beyond, you know, what the Bible calls sin. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 9. First Peter 2 9 the Bible says but ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood and holy nation a peculiar people that ye should shew forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light see God's people are a holy nation see you cannot be a, a child of God without you know being holy God's people are to represent holiness. We are a peculiar people. You know, we are different from the world. You know, God never had intentions for His people to be like the world. You know, we know that, you know, all the way with Israel. You know, going back to the early part of the Old Testament. That's what the book of Leviticus is all about. You don't want to have anything to do with holiness. You know, the book of Leviticus is all about holiness. Of course, you know, we don't abide under that you know, live under that Old Testament law anymore, but that law was implemented for Israel to be different than the world. First Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. See, Christians are to be holy as God is holy. See what it says there, the latter part of, of verse 15? Be ye holy in all manner of conversation. That's all of it. That's not it's okay to have a couple things in your life that ought to not be. You can just, you know, leave them there, you know, and do it, and let your children do it, and watch it, or whatever else. Be holy in all manner of conversation. Romans chapter 12 and verse number 1. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. See, it's only our reasonable service to sacrifice our flesh and live a holy life. See, to deny our flesh and live holy, that's the only life that God accepts. It says, acceptable. See, holy, what word comes after holy? Acceptable unto God. And it's only our reasonable service. Now, verse number 2 of Romans 12. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, when we're no longer conformed to this world, but living a life of prayer and Bible study, and that's when we'll find God's perfect will for our lives. See, we've got to replace worldliness. What do you do whenever you get worldliness out? You give yourself to prayer and Bible study, first and foremost. And then God leads you and directs you into what His perfect will is for you. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7, it says, For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. See, that's really just common sense and common knowledge that a lot of people are missing. You know, God doesn't save us to live unclean lives, but holy lives. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 Abstain from all appearance of evil. See, another very deep verse there. See, all, giving all your heart to God, you abstain from all appearance of evil. See, that's the goal of a real Christian, a real spiritual person. They want to abstain from all appearance of evil, just from the appearance of evil. 
just from the appearance of it. I don't want to have any type of appearance of worldliness in my life. You know, that's why I will refuse to watch television that includes profanity and, and ungodliness. James chapter 4 and verse number 7, hitting on this earlier. James 4.17, I think I might have said verse 27, but it's James 4.17. James 4.17, if I did say 27. Simply therefore to him that knoweth to do God, and doeth it not to him it is sin. See, that's an immature Christian. But it says, well, I know it's wrong to listen to, say, to uh, uh, you know, country music, pop, rock, rap music, you know, what have you. I know that's wrong, you know, my kids do it. And I know it's wrong, but I don't want to put forth the effort to get it out of their life. I know it's wrong to look at pornography, but... <clears throat> but, you know, I just can't stop entertaining my flesh. I can't get... I'm not going to try to get my kids to quit looking at it. I'm not going to try to get rid of, uh, you know, movies, filthy movies and things in my house. And all it ought to not be. I know witchcraft is wrong, but... You know, it's still there. See, a person in love with God, doing all they can to please God, they're not going to have any known sin in their life. Things that God reveals to them that's wrong. And a lot of things we're talking about is, you know, kind of elementary. But, you know, that, that's just part of the issue there. A lot of things people do, you know, is elementary. But, you know, they still won't cease doing it. They won't get it out of their life. But, see, a truly spiritual person, if they know something is wrong, they're not going to tolerate it in their life. You know, they're not going to let their children do it. They're not going to let it in their house. See, Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, another familiar text. Another Bible, probably kind of know where I'm headed with this one. Matthew 7, starting in verse number 16. It says, Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is honed down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. See, a holy person will have pleasant fruit in their life. They'll have a godly family, a godly home life. They're going to be a witness in the community. But, you know, godly homes are just becoming more rare every day. You know, parents and their children argue. Children are rebellious and want to get in the world. You know, parents just don't teach their children the Bible. You know, or pray with them. Parents been, you know, parents themselves, you know, they're spending more time with television, sports, and recreational things than they do in prayer and the Bible. And see, when you just examine all of this, you know, is it no surprise that, you know, people are full of hypocrisy? I like that there. That's a good test in verse number 20, like what Jesus says. By their fruits ye shall know them. Well, let's just think about that for a minute. You know, what, what does somebody know you as? You know, what's your identity? You know, for so many people now, you know, you say their name, yeah. You know, a big sports fan. You know, into this, that, and the other. The, they know you as a believer. Somebody living a holy, consecrated life to God. So now we'll go to 1 John chapter 2. <laughs> 1 John chapter number 2. I'm switch. Kind of go into our next section of this here and look at worldliness a little bit. First John chapter number two. <clears throat> First John two and looking at verses fifteen and sixteen. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father isn't in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of the life is not of the Father, but is of the world. See, if a person loves the world, 
They don't love the Father. See, the world and God do not mix. You know, that's all through the Bible. You know, that is, you know, relatively elementary. You know, see, that's what we said when we began. You know, lots of believers today, you know, they're not going to say, I'm completely sold out to God. Yet, they're not going to consider their self to be a hypocrite either. You know, once again, they'd say that they're somewhere in the middle of holiness and worldliness. You know, I'm just not, not really holy. So that holy, but I'm not a, you know, I'm, I'm not a full-blown heathen, so they're somewhere in the middle. So that they're saying they're in the middle of light and darkness. They're in the middle of light and darkness, but if you know the Bible, you know that's not at all scriptural. That is, that is extremely contrary to the Bible and what it says. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, And verse number 5, that latter phrase says, We are not of the night, nor of darkness. I'm sorry, that's not the one I wanted. Bear with me. What communion hath light with darkness? That's yeah, somewhere in the Bible. I didn't write that down. Bear with me. Yes, that's Second Corinthians six seventeen. Second Corinthians six seventeen. I wrote that down, but I didn't write the reference there because I just wanted the latter part of that popular verse. But the first part there says, Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate. See, you have to separate light from darkness. You know, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. <clears throat> and that's up in verse number 14 there. I still didn't quite hit the verse all the way. Yeah, verse 14 there, starting with that popular verse. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? You know, and what communion hath light with darkness? Light and darkness cannot mix. <clears throat> and now we go over to 1 Thessalonians 5.5. 5. I had that one written down. But that's a, a different verse, but a good one that says, you know, the same thing. In 1 Thessalonians 5.5. 5. Ye are the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. 1 John 1.5. First John one five. This then is the let's see, it's a one five. Yes. See, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. First John two eight. Again, a new command, commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shines. See, our darkness is to be past. See, a person who's in the middle of light and darkness is claiming they serve God and the world. See, they're pretty much just saying, well, I serve God and the world to some extent, but once again, you know, it's pretty elementary that that's not possible. You know, another very common verse in the Bible, Matthew 6, 24. Matthew 6, 24. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You know, we cannot serve God in the world. You know, you know the, the reply, this reply here, that people give, well, I'm not, not really holy, but I'm not extremely worldly. But that's not scriptural. And this crowd that claims to be in the middle, they have nothing but the world in their personal life. They might go to church, which is good. But see, in their personal life, and their home life and all, that there's nothing but worldliness. And once again, that just explains why there's not a revival in churches. So see, that's what a hypocrite is, isn't it? 
That's somebody who's one thing at church, who claims to love God, but whenever they're outside of the church, whenever they're not around anybody else, there's no prayer there, there's no Bible study, there's no holiness, there's nothing but worldliness. You know, they home, they go home and they give themselves over to idols of some kind. You know, it's, no, it's no wonder why churches are dead and fruitless and why, you know, most Bible-believing churches just get smaller and smaller and, you know, certainly explains why so many young people, you know, leave fundamental churches as soon as they can. You know, as soon as they move out of their parents' house. You know, why do you want something that just, you know, is so fake? It just looks so fake. James chapter 4 and verse number 4. James 4.4 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? So therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. See, people joined to the world are the enemy of God. How's that? Because worldly people hate holiness. That's just the fact of the reality. People that are worldly, they hate holiness. Say, I was there one time. I was there one time as a lost person and as a spiritually dead Christian, like I said. I wanted nothing to do with holy living when I was a you know a lost teenager. I wanted you know, I wanted horror movies, I wanted pornography. I wanted heavy metal music. I didn't, I didn't want anything of holiness. Didn't like holy people. Didn't like my dad. Didn't like the pastor of the church. I wanted nothing to do with that. You know, like that's, that's what my family did. You know, we went from a very dead, you know, independent Baptist church that got very worldly to a much more separated fundamental Baptist church. And I didn't, I didn't want to have anything to do with it. See, God's holy, God's greatest attribute is holiness. First Chronicles 29. First Chronicles chapter 29. First Chronicles 29 and verse number 16. says, O Lord our God, all this store that we have prepared to build thee in house for thine holy name cometh of thine hand, and is all thine own. Psalm 68, 5. Psalm 68, 5. A father of the fatherless and a judge of the widows is God in his holy habitation. The holiness is the habitation of God. You can't have God without His holiness. See, once again, that goes just back to, you know, like living in an open marriage. You know, whenever you marry somebody, you know, you, you're a part of their habitation. You know, you live with them. Your habitation goes hand in hand. See, you know, your lifestyle goes with their lifestyle. See, and if you're joined to God, if you're a child of God, you must live in His holy habitation. You know, just like we read that verse from Hebrews 12, 14, one of the first ones we looked at. Like it says, you know, you can't see God without His holiness. You know, I can't look at my wife and observe my wife without observing her lifestyle and the things she does. You know, that's why when I met my wife, my wife's death, I had to learn American Sign Language to communicate with her. I can't have my daughter without my daughter's lifestyle. See, you can't see God without His attribute of holiness. See, and worldly Christians are just that. You know, they're full of worldliness, not holiness. Like Ephesians chapter 4 says, Ephesians 4, starting in verse number 17. It says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. 
See, if you walk with God, you got to do just that. You know, you're walking with God. You're walking with holiness. You know, you can't walk like a heathen does. You know, you can't enjoy the things of the world and enjoy the things of God. You know, you can't worship God in the beauty of holiness like it says in the Psalms. <clears throat> you know, if you're not walking holy. Continuing to verse number 18, Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over into lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. See, these people had a blind heart. You know, they have a blind heart, and they're producing uncleanliness and greediness. See, that's exactly what worldly Christians do. You know, they're unclean, and they just have the greed of the world. Want more and more of the world. Matthew 13, 22 really wants you to listen to this verse. Matthew 13, 22. Turn over there if you haven't been turning, if you got a Bible handy. Read this verse and highlight it. I, I'm not a person that hardly, hardly ever does that. This is a verse, though, worth highlighting. <clears throat> Matthew 13, 22. Jesus speaking. He says, He also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word. And the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. See, that verse there just sums up worldly believers to a T. You want one Bible verse that describes worldly people and worldly churches. It's right there. They choke on the Word of God. They don't abide by it. They don't live holy. They don't raise their children for the glory of God. They don't pray. They don't study the Bible. They just don't have a walk with God. They're not spiritual but they go after the riches of this world and they have no fruit. You know, they're after all the recreation and all the things that the world has and they bear no fruit whatsoever. I'm going to look at a couple of them here. We're almost done. 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. I know you didn't think that I was really going to do a uh, like right before our revival that's coming up here next week. Most of you probably, Bible Conference Revival, starting Monday the 18th at the present time of this. You, you didn't think that I was going to do a special message like this this long, and guess what? I didn't either. God just led me to do it. <laughs> but God leads me to do it, then I do it. First Peter chapter 4 and verse number 3. It says, For the past of our life may, suffice, may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable, abominable idolatries. See, these things here are supposed to be past. The fruits of a lost person. They're not to be, they're, they're not to be in, a, in a believer's life, somebody that's saved. But that's exactly how so many believers are now. They, everything in this verse may not apply to them, but a lot of it does. Like lasciviousness. You know, that's like sexual immorality. Like, look at all the sexual immorality people have on their television. You know, like pornography, looking at, you know, fornication, adultery, you know, etc., etc. I mean, even, even lots of people, if they don't do these things, you know, like even if they're not their self necessarily sexually immoral, or like it says, access of wine, you know, with all the drinking and all, lots of people have that also through their television. It's hard to watch any kind of TV show without seeing people drinking. But people are, though, they're filled with the lust of the world, like it says. They have the lust of the world. You know, they want all the recreation, all the entertainment, all the money, you know, all the great things of the world. You know, it's just where their treasure is. It's not in the things of God. You know, it's not in prayer. It's, it's not in the Bible. It's not, it's not the church's ministry. It's not living for God. They just want all the, all the things they can of the world. They're filled with the lust of the world. Then, like it says, revelings, banquetings. That's excessive forms of recreation. And that's just what people are full of. You know, that's what people are full of. You know, like we say all the time here, that's just the fact of the reality. 
you know, of people who even are in Bible, so-called Bible-believing fundamental Baptist churches. You know, they give the television five hours a day, and they might give God five minutes a day, if that much. You know, then like we were just saying there, you know, the idolatries, you know, they have the idols of sports athletes, Hollywood celebrities, politicians, and... And you know the idols of worldly things, of having all the of all the nice clothes and, and everything. You know, gotta have the latest edition of everything that comes out. Just the heart. You know, that's just set on greed, like we already read. But the good news is, it's possible to change. It's possible to change all this. Like I said, I was that way before when I was lost. I was in a church every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, anything, anytime anything special and all was going on in the church. But I didn't have a heart for it. How do we change that? We're just going to go to one chapter here. The Bible gives us a prescription of it. In John 15, of course, there's a lot more we could use of the Bible to do this, but, you know, this is just one message. This isn't a whole, a whole series. But we got good stuff here, just in a few verses out of John 15, starting in verse number 3. It says, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Well, how do I get clean? How do I get this out of my life and out of my mind? How do I get pornography and, and you know, what, whatever else out? You know, this love and this consumption, you know, for, for television and sports and all. You got to get clean through the word of God. Like I said, you have to replace that with the Bible. If you don't pray and read the Bible, you're never going to get victory over the flesh. Just quit it. You know, just drop it. If you have zero Bible and prayer in your life, you're never going to get a victory over the flesh. And see, the thing is, if you just give 30 minutes a day to prayer in the Bible, you're not going to get victory over your flesh. You have to carve out a large amount of time, a large amount of time in your life for, for the... For devotional purposes, when I say devotions, I mean like prayer and studying the Bible, not just not just reading the Bible. Of course, you, if you're not reading the Bible, you just need to start reading it. But studying the Bible, like I saw the time of this ministry, when when I became a student of the Bible, I, it was it was a life changing. It's a life changing practice. We got to study the Bible with commentaries and Bible dictionaries and carve out a, a large amount of my time to it. I know giving God 30 minutes a day is better than nothing, but if you really want victory, you know, you're going to have to, you're going to have to give God hours out of your day. <clears throat> and I talk about the opposite of, you know, the, the opposite of no prayer and Bible study, revival. You don't want to say, well, you're talking all about this revival, having a revival, you know, getting filled with the Holy Spirit. you got to give hours a day to prayer and study the Bible. Like uh, John Wesley, one of the leaders of the First Great Awakening, like he used to often say, he don't have any confidence in a Christian that don't pray at least four hours a day. I mean, he was a man who saw revival. That's what he said. You need to give God at least four hours a day just in prayer. <clears throat> See, we got to get clean through the Word of God. Then verse number four. Kind of getting ahead of ourselves there. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. See, abiding in Christ, we got to do that through prayer. We got to be talking to God through prayer. We got to let God be talking to us in the Bible. Verse number five I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. See, without God you can't do anything. You can't get victory without God. And by having God, you got to have prayer and the study of God's Word. Going to church is a good thing that everybody ought to be doing, but the problem is that's just where it ends. You know, we use that terminology churchgoer. And, you know, that does describe a lot of believers. They go to church, but they don't have it at the house. You know, they don't have it anywhere outside the church. It's in verse number 8. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. See, when we bear fruit, we're a disciple of Christ. If you don't have any fruit in your life, then you're not a disciple. 
See, in most people today, they don't even have fruit with their children. You know, you have the opposite. You know, you got young people leaving, you know, leaving churches. You know, going the ways of the world. But it's possible, though, to be a disciple. You know, we got to remove, we got to get things out of our life that shouldn't be. Then we got to put things in our life that should be, like the study of God's Word and the Bible. You know, it's really just common sense. You know, don't be surprised if your children end up worldly when you let your children watch horror movies and look at pornography and listen to filthy music. You know, your kids aren't going to become... Your kids aren't going to become, you know, a disciple of Christ. You know, they're going to end up a child of the world. See, and it's really just a very, you know, a very basic prescription that we have to follow. But the problem is people in this day and time don't follow it. But thanks so much there for being with us. Continue in prayer. Continue in the Bible. And as we said there, certainly getting ready for revival this coming week. I guess that's why God had me preach this message here on this Friday. Uh, didn't, wasn't expecting it, but God sprung it on us. Amen. And so we are thankful for technology that we're able to meet over the cyber waves and reach everybody in the world. Amen. And so we're very thankful for it. Thank you so much for being with us. And, uh, and with all that we did here today, when what, like 45 minutes, so, you know, want to wanna close out in prayer of what we said here. Our Father, we sure do love you. We thank you for the gifts of sin. And we thank you for your word, Lord, and how it helps us live a better life. You know, I'm not living a better life because of Randy Todd Cooper, because of who I am. You know, I'm not even living a better life, you know, because of the education or anything I got. I'm living a better life because of you, because I abided in you. And I brought forth some fruit, and I thank you for that, Lord. And I pray more people would do it, that they'd give their self to prayer and the study of God's Word, and that they would love holiness like they're supposed to, and that they would hate the world, and that you would raise up more people to love you, and to love holiness, and to love your Word. And just help us all, Lord, to be faithful, to do what you've called us to do, and to be what you would have us to be, that more people would just go down the path that you have for them. You know, that they would just go down that path and that they would fulfill your will for their lives, Lord. And just help us and keep us and use us for your honor and for your glory. And bless the meeting that we have next week, our Bible Conference Revival. And just, you know, be with us though the rest of this week. You know, as we still have a weekend study to do, we're also going to be preaching in sign language and voice. And they're going to be preaching Sunday in Psalm 37. So bless us, please. The remainder of this week, help us all to be faithful and just use us for your honor and glory. And revive us, so wilt thou not revive us again. Revive our hearts, Lord. Give us that spirit of revival. Spirit of prayer. Spirit of holiness. Spirit of your word, Lord. Spirit of fasting. And we'll certainly be careful to give you all the praise and all the glory of God because of you alone for us in the blessed. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray all these things. Amen and amen. Thank you so much, folks, for being with us. And I will see you next time. Until that, everybody can the shadows flee away. I am Dr. Cooper, and I love you, and I appreciate you.